the calling of a minister. See, I believe everyone in this building is called to be a minister of God. Not just Pastor Connor, not just Pastor Alex, not just Pastor Jonathan or I, but everyone is called to minister. And I want to tell you that there's really only one thing you need to minister in a great way. And so I want to turn your attention to 1 Peter as we look at one principle that allows you to minister in a great way, to be a great minister of God. Now, some of you in this building, I realize like, well, Pastor Andy, I don't really have a ministry, so how does this apply to me? Well, let's just wait and see. I believe all of us are ministers, and wherever we go, we minister. So 1 Peter chapter 2. Verse, verse 4. And Peter is speaking to a uh, group that may not fit our context. Because the people that he is speaking to is a group of people that have been disenfranchised. People that uh, do not have rights. They are foreigners. They are not natives to the land. And they are being outcasted by society. And Peter writes to these group of individuals on how to minister in that context. And so I believe that if they could minister in a land that they didn't have much money, in a land that they were outcasted and they were still able to serve Jesus Christ, then we also can learn from this principle. And this is what Peter says to this group of people. Verse 4, as you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him. That's where I want to stop. Notice how Peter says, as you come to him. To him, the living stone. How important that ministry starts with Jesus. Jesus is our living stone, capital S. He's the head honcho. Without him, we are nothing. And without him, ministry is meaningless. Ministry can become a burden when you don't connect with Jesus. Katie and I were at the base of the Temple Mount. And for those of you that know, the Temple Mount is, is where the temple uh, resided. And the Temple Mount, it's a big thing. It was one of the um, wonders of the ancient world. It was three times bigger than the Roman Colosseum. Three times bigger, the, the Temple Mount. And we were sitting at the base next to the western wall that was still standing after many, many years. And what was interesting uh, was they preserved the stones and the stones that had fallen off from, from, from the western wall. There was one tablet that said, this is where the trumpet, trumpeteer would stand when the trumpeteer would announce the Sabbath from the shofar. That's where Jesus would have heard the horn from Jerusalem. It was beautiful. But, but what captivated my attention was this wall, but, but, but there were many like layers of this wall. And then there was one solid layer without any cuts between it. And it was standing in the corners of this wall. And it was called a cornerstone. See, there are several cornerstones on this building This one cornerstone weighs 120 tons. Isn't that crazy? How did they put that up there? Well, it's that would take too much. uh, That would take uh, too long to explain. 120 tons. And the reason why they needed this cornerstone was not only because they needed to make sure that the weight could be supported, but the cornerstone also allowed all the other stones to have the right measurement. If the cornerstone was off by just an inch, everything else was lost. 
The foundation was important. And, and our archaeology um, guide, he said, if you look at the cornerstone now, right now, it's so perfect that if you bring your measurements, you would see it's a perfect line. No wonder Jesus is compared in the New Testament to the cornerstone because Jesus sets that line for us. Without Jesus, we would not be able to do ministry. It is a temptation for ministers, for pastors, for church leaders to do ministry without Jesus. It is. It's like, uh, you know, I, I, used to, I used to be an avid swimmer at Andrews. And I would wake up early in the morning to swim at Andrews. Some of you may know the pool. And this was the first time that I really um, began swimming. And I remember that I didn't really understand before I started swimming that the line in the, at, in, in the, in the ground of the floor, those lines were, were there for a purpose. <laughs> it, just, it wasn't just there for decoration. And I realized that because, because when I swam, I noticed that there were other swimmers too, and I needed to make sure that I was aligning myself with that line. If I didn't, and if I closed my eyes for whatever reason, water came in, I would start to veer off to the right, or I would veer off to the left. But if I kept my sight on the line, I would be straight. And that's the same way when doing ministry. We got to keep our eyes on Jesus. That's one of the reasons why Markham Woods is a great church to belong to. It's the reason why our philosophy centers on Jesus. Our mission statement, if I haven't mentioned over a hundred times, is to what? To bring the healing power of Jesus Christ to broken relationships. It's on Jesus. Without Jesus, there is nothing. Spend time in his word. Spend time with him. If you're feeling burned out in ministry, if you're feeling burned out in serving God, come back to the air, which is Jesus. Ellen White says this about Jesus in Desire of Ages. I love this, and it's such a strong rebuke to me sometimes. She says, and by connection with Christ, the living stone, all who build upon this foundation become living stones. Many persons are by their own endeavors hewn, polished, and beautified, but they cannot become living stones because they are not connected with Christ. Without this connection, no man can be saved. Without the life of Christ in us, we cannot withstand the storms of temptation. Our eternal safety depends upon our building upon the sure foundation. Multitudes are today... Building upon foundations that have not been tested, when the rain falls and the tempest rages and the floods come, their house will fall. Because it is not founded upon the eternal rock, the chief cornerstone, Christ Jesus. What does that mean? We can try any strategy we want in ministry and in serving people, but unless, but if it's not grounded in Jesus, it's not going to go anywhere. We are the vine, he is the vine, we are the branches. And there's one more thing I wanted to tell you, and that is, and that is here found in uh, verse 5. If you look in your Bibles, chap uh, chapter 2, verse 5, it says, You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house. Let me be honest with you. About a few months ago, I, Katie and I were having a conversation on ministry. And Katie has always been, Katie's my wife, by the way. Katie has always been in uh, missions. Everywhere she went, she was part of the ministry. At Southern, she was part of the ministry group. At, at the, at, at, in North Carolina, she was part of a mission group. When she came to Orlando, she was part of the mission creation health 
and now she had transferred to administration, and we were having a talk, and I had slipped out of my mouth. I said, that's not ministry. <laughs> just just kind of slipped it out. That's not ministry. What you do at this church is ministry. About two or three weeks later, or two, three weeks ago, maybe two weeks ago, we were talking about it again, and, we, and she brought it up again. She said, you know, I never forgot what you said. <laughs> oh, is that new to you? Is that new? <laughs> I guess that's a known thing. You said that my job wasn't really ministry, and I had to reflect on that because it had been tormenting her that where she worked wasn't ministry. She wasn't serving God. And as I did study, I realized that ministry is not where you go. It's who you are. You see, we are the living stones. We are the new temple. Jesus dwells within us. So wherever you go, ministry can happen. Whether you're working out or in the hospital or at church, wherever you go, God, Jesus, dwells within you. You see, for, Israelite, for the Israelites, the Lord commanded them, Moses, to build them a, what, tabernacle so I may dwell with them. Later years develop and the tabernacle becomes the temple. And then from the temple, Jesus comes as the embodiment of God on earth. And then Jesus says, now you are the temple. You represent me. Wherever you go, I will be there. And so wherever you go, Jesus is there. And so church family, I just want you to remember today one thing, maybe two things. Connect with Jesus. Connect with him. He will be able to uplift your soul and you will find energy in serving people, serving your church, and serving in your community. Number one. Number two, remember that wherever you go, ministry can happen. Most of you know uh, the theologian and philosopher. He was one of our church history um, uh, great minds. Many people see him as the, as, the, uh, as the big guy in church history. He, just, he, just, he has written so many things. His name is Thomas Aquinas. Anyone know of him? As a, you, know, you may know of him. Thomas Aquinas. And he wrote things that were, that were right. And he also wrote things that were very confusing and hard to understand and probably wrong. But it's interesting. At the end of his life he starts writing a massive work called the Summa Theologica, which is the summary of theology. He was trying to condense the knowledge of God into one book. He said, I want to give this to the people. That was his ministry. He was just writing, and he wanted to write what God was in, in philosophy, in theology, in, um, in anthropology, and everything that he had studied. He wanted to put it in one book, and as he's writing this book, he starts to spend time with Jesus, and he prays, and people start hearing him pray, and he sounds like a child praying to God. His faith becomes more simple. And all of a sudden, in one day, he stops writing the book completely. And so his secretary came up to him and he asked him, Thomas, you need to keep writing. Why aren't you writing? And this is what Thomas Aquinas said. I can do no more. Such things have been revealed to me that all I have written seems so much straw. Wow. He was basically saying my writing is worthless. Everything that I was doing, it, it, it doesn't matter because he got to meet Jesus. And so many times in our ministries and in serving people, sometimes we lose sight that Jesus 
is where we need to keep our eyes on. And so church family, can we take that challenge? What would that look like if we kept our eyes on Jesus? I believe ministry, even though this, the ministry is great, like for example, the care team at our church, I've heard so many compliments on that. The care team just did a funeral service this, um, this past week where they provide food for the family. It's something that we offer to the community. We have leaders there that put their eyes on Jesus. And we have many leaders that do that. Church family, let's continue to put our eyes on Jesus. And if you are someone in this church that want to start in a ministry or want to maybe belong to one of our ministries, come talk to us. We can find you a place. But the number one thing I'll tell you, keep your eyes on Jesus. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, Lord, you have said there is only one thing that we need, and we need to keep our eyes on you. We need to keep our eyes on you and our faith in you. And Lord, you've called us to serve other people. But Lord, we want to keep our eyes on Jesus, your son. We thank you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen.